Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'm talking about Season 2, Episode 3, The Jacket. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I'm doing okay. It's been a week here um, in my life. Since I last recorded, I was pretty busy with some acting jobs, which is awesome. I'm so thankful every time I get work. Yeah, over the weekend, I filmed a vignette for this professor from uh, CSU, the film school there, um, Colorado State University. She is this wonderful director, and she and her writing partner have written a great script. I was privileged enough to partake in the table read of this. It's a feature film um, that they've written, and they are looking to get it going and get funding for it. It's been a long uh, labor of love for these these two women. And it's a film about women and things that women go through at different stages of their life. So what I was a part of was an episode that they will be using. It's one of many episodes that'll be they're filming and um, in order to get funding for the film and kind of pitch it and, and stuff like that. So the one I was a part of had to do with infertility and miscarriage and just, you know, subject matters that aren't talked about enough in our society. So I was really, really honored to be a part of it. And it was such a great experience filming with not only a female director, but it was an all-female cast, and pretty much the entire crew was all-female. There were there were a few, few dudes, but for the most part, I mean, the director of photography was a woman, and all, all the usual kind of crew jobs you see men doing, it was women doing. And it was just such a great environment, such a comfortable place to film scenes about miscarriage or and not being able to get pregnant and the, the things that women will put their bodies through in order to get pregnant. So it was just such a great experience. Very honored to be a part of that. Also, it's just been a week. It's been a challenging parenting week. That's all I'll say about that. It's, uh, um, I guess I have a little more to say about that. No, it's just been one of those, something new has kind of cropped up and I'm trying to figure out how to deal with it and it's it's been it's been a challenge but I am an eternal optimist so I know that with the proper help and proper guidance not only for my my child but for myself and my husband I think we'll we'll get through it but um yeah it's just you know we're entering new phases of our kids lives and with that comes some emotional uh, growing pains, I guess you can say. And um, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of in that now. I guess it came up sooner than I thought. And I think every parent feels that way. Time just seems to go really fast as they get older. So anyway, it's been a little bit emotionally draining. But today I've decided, you know what, um, I'm not going to let it conquer me. And I'm going to just keep going. And I'm the parent, so I can't fall apart, (laughs) and I just need to keep going for the sake of my kid. And that's what I intend to do. If any of you out there are struggling with, uh, you know, a parenting challenge, I feel you, and uh, I'm with you there in spirit, and we can get through this. All right, so back to the episode. Wow, that was kind of like some heavy stuff that I just laid on you. But um, let's get back to something lighter, like Seinfeld. (laughs) The synopsis from my coffee table book for the jacket is as follows. Jerry wears his expensive new suede jacket to meet Elaine's novelist father, Alton Bennis. When snow begins to fall, Jerry turns the jacket inside out, revealing a pink candy-striped lining. Because Bennis refuses to walk with him dressed that way, Jerry ends up wearing the jacket the normal way and ruining the leather. Kramer agrees to look after his magician friend's doves and enlists Elaine to help pick them up, while George can't get a song from Les Miserables out of his head. This episode was written by Larry and Jerry. So the first scene is the shopping scene with Jerry and Elaine. Jerry's shopping. Elaine's kind of there as support and helping him out. I don't know. I like the dynamic here. It kind of reminded me of the first scene we see with Elaine and Jerry at the video store and this kind of back and forth and having some discussion while doing another activity. And I like that Elaine laughs at Jerry's dumb Thai car wash thing. She laughs like 
a little too hard at it, but I don't know. I love it. I love her laugh acting again. Once again, I think that that is one of JLD's real strengths. She can just laugh so convincingly. I love it. So a woman comes up to Elaine and recognizes the book she is carrying and says how wonderful it is. And so this is obviously, well, the whole scene is set up. We know that all the time. The first scene is to set up everything. Her recognition of the book prompts Jerry to point out that it's Elaine's father. And I like that it's Jerry that points that out. I don't think Elaine would have done that if Jerry hadn't jumped in. It establishes how much Jerry respects Alton Bennis. And you can tell right away, even from just that little statement, and then a little bit later with the conversation about the dinner, that Jerry is not only really uh, respectful of the way he writes, but he's just also incredibly intimidated by someone that's that talented. So I just I just like that. Um, it wasn't Elaine who said, oh, it's my dad. You know, it was Jerry who had to point that out. So nice little peek into the relationship, not only between Jerry and Elaine, but also how Jerry feels about Alton Venice. Then we kind of get into Elaine making sure that Jerry and George are going to that dinner. And when Jerry kind of hints that, I don't know, she goes right into a little bit of a panic. No, 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 Jerry, you have to. And And so we find out that she and her father don't have the closest relationship and that she needs a buffer and they haven't seen each other in a while. So it's it's a nice little setup there, too, where, okay, we're finding out more about what Elaine's relationship is with her father. And then we see the jacket. Elaine's delivery after she sees that price tag, I love it. I think it's so convincing. You really feel from her delivery and from just how she was like, oh, you understand how indulgent of a purchase that would be for Jerry. But I have to disagree. I mean, so that lining is terrible. They did a good job. Whoever was the, I guess it would be wardrobe, maybe prop and wardrobe, just whoever decided on that lining did a great job because that would be a deal breaker for me. And if you're going to spend this insane amount of money on a jacket, you shouldn't also have to worry about changing out the lining. Like Elaine says, it's so just, oh, it's just a lining. You can have a change. It's like, well, no, if you're spending that much money, the lining should not have to go through any changes. So for me, that would have been a deal breaker. So, of course, this is our setup scene. We know about George and Jerry meeting Elaine for dinner with her father and that he has just discovered the most incredible jacket he has ever seen. Overall, I like the scene. Uh, It feels really natural that Elaine would help Jerry with his shopping, even though they're just friends. Elaine is that type of friend that's going to have an opinion. She's not going to kind of half-ass her shopping trip with you. She'll definitely let you know what she thinks. The exposition is well delivered. Again, they have to get all this information out and it's done pretty well. I liked that the woman recognizes that book and that was a smoother way of getting out the whole Alton Bennis storyline. Okay, and then this jacket. I At most for me, it's good. I mean, I I know my opinion really doesn't matter. I don't think anyone's opinion really matters. You know, the show establishes that this, for Jerry, this is just a beautiful jacket. Well, I guess everyone in the cast, they love this jacket. Elaine does talk about how soft it is. So I guess we're just seeing it. We're not feeling it. But to me, I liked his leather jacket better, the one that Kramer ends up taking. The suede, I don't know, suede in general for me always looks kind of sloppy with all like the uneven tones and it's matte and it's not shiny. I don't know. It's to me, I'm just not a big fan of suede. But hey, it's 1991 fashion. I know I have to keep that in mind all the time. I'm trying to go back of that time period and remind myself of things. And what this actually reminded me of was at that time I was in junior high and there was a trend of that type of suede jacket. Now, the ones the popular kids in my school wore were more tan. It wasn't this dark brown. And there was no way I was getting that. I mean, even though I didn't even really like that jacket, but if the popular kids were wearing it, I wanted to do it because I was obsessed with being popular. Just a little bit of a view into my childhood and where my mind was at in junior high. (laughs) I was a little bit obsessed with being popular. Didn't work out very well, spoiler alert. But um, yeah, there's no way my parents would buy one for me. Um, And I don't remember the brand of the jacket, but all I do remember is that in the halls of Churchill Junior High School in Royal Oak, Michigan, all the popular kids were wearing gerbeau jeans. 
paired with these tan suede jackets. And another thing I remember is that they smelled weird, these jackets. Probably the, it's probably the smell that most people like about suede and leather. And maybe it's the Hindu in me. I don't know. But as far as I was concerned, those jackets did not smell great at all. Like I'm smelling the skin of cows. So I don't know. Maybe it was just me. But I uh, still would have liked one so I could fit in. But I uh, certainly did not care for the aesthetic. For these next few scenes, there's no Elaine, but I'll just go over real quick what happens in the second scene. We're in Jerry's apartment. It's after his purchase of the jacket. He's just wearing it with his PJs because he's just so enamored with it. And Kramer takes Jerry's other jacket, the one that I like better. And then the next scene, we're in Jerry's apartment again. This is the scene pre-dinner with Alton Bennis. And there's no Elaine here either, but George has the Les Mis song stuck in his head and gets this huge boner for the jacket. Sorry to make you think about George's boner. Uh, But it's just sometimes it's the fun way to say that someone got really excited about something. Hello, I'm 12 years old. Uh, So he gets a huge boner for this ugly ass jacket. Okay, fine. I'll just say jacket from now on. My opinion doesn't matter. (laughs) But uh, and then he I do like the little obsession that George has with how much Jerry paid for it. At first, he's like, I'm not even gonna ask. It's fine, whatever it is. And then by the end of that scene, he's going insane about what did you pay? He did have a little mention about his staunch heterosexuality, just an ongoing theme of George's homophobia. And we oh, we also find out about Kramer needing a salad with picking up some birds of his friends because he's going to be watching them. Okay, so now we go to the hotel lobby scene. Uh, no Elaine yet, but this is where <laughs> George and Jerry see and meet Alton Bennis. And it's just the epitome of awkwardness. And something I have to, I, I do have to say, so this actor who plays Alton Bennis is named Lawrence Tierney, and I'll get more into his background in a bit. Actually, one of our contributors did a really good job with some background on him, so I'll mention that later. I think one of the best parts, I think his whole performance is fantastic, but I love that he plays this guy who just doesn't care about awkwardness. In fact, he's driving the awkwardness, and he sort of gets off on that like he can tell George and Jerry are just so scared of him and intimidated by him but he it's not his problem and he's just going to keep staring at them so some people live for that kind of awkwardness I'm not one of them but uh, clearly Alton Bennis is we move on to the hotel bathroom scene where George and Jerry are pretty much just panicking in the bathroom I love George's line he says we'll say we're frightened and we have to go home (laughs) It's so it's so well written and well delivered. Okay, so back to the lobby in the hotel again, and Alton Bennis gets a message. He finds out Elaine will be there in 30 minutes. Oh gosh. And you know that that 30 minutes to George and Jerry feels like 30 days. It's just it's just torturous. Finally, in the next scene, Elaine arrives. It's 30 minutes later in the hotel lobby. So Elaine arrives while her father has excused himself to go to the bathroom. And I just love, again, (laughs) Jason Alexander's kind of on fire in this episode. But when he does the impression, he went to the bathroom. Um, That wasn't a good impression that I just did. But I I do love George's impression of (laughs) where Alton is. Uh, and so it turns out Elaine is late because she she did cram, she did Kramer a solid. And the only reason she did it was in exchange for a ride to the hotel. That's in New York, especially for someone who doesn't have a car and someone who needs to get somewhere. I think that's a very, as Jerry says, a very alluring offer. So she took it. But of course it goes awry. And this was another great comedic monologue. And JLD just delivers it perfectly, especially that little physicality with the doves flying out of her coat pockets. Just a really great visual there. And I I loved everything about it. You really feel all the emotions. I think the delivery is better than the actual writing of the monologue. To me, it was a little bit, mm, a little bit flimsy, but I think she does a really, I think, JLD does a really great job giving it as much life as she could. So Jerry and George, after hearing about what Elaine went through, they they choose not to complain at all about how much they are scared of her father. 
And I like that Elaine does acknowledge. She, it definitely relieves her when they say, oh, no, it's been great because she knows. And she says, well, dad can make some people uncomfortable. And so I, I do I do like that. She's well aware of that. But she's super relieved that her friends don't feel that way, apparently. And I like the interaction finally when Alton comes back between he and Elaine. It felt very real, very grounded based on what she said at the at the shop, she, you know, doesn't have a very close relationship. It's not very affectionate or huggy touchy. And after you after you've seen Alton Bennis and those preceding scenes, you can understand why. I definitely like their just their little interaction. Who's the lipstick for? And you know, how's your mother? Like it's very just kind of transactional, but you know, they're still father and daughter and she's making an effort. And the effort is sort of this mutual understanding. Look, it's it's not going to be anything really emotional. It's just this is how we how we act together. I like that when he asks about her job, you know, she's like, you, you get the sense she's told him this before. He just doesn't remember. And apparently Alton has some issue with pendant publishing. <laughs> I wonder what that's all about. Uh, Mr. Bennis insists that they walk to the Pakistani restaurant So Jerry kind of panics because it just starts snowing. Elaine's very excited. I like her little reaction there that it's so beautiful. But hmm, snow on suede, that doesn't seem to work very well. So he turns it inside out and has to turn it back right side out when Alton Bennis is not going to tolerate a candy striped funny guy walking with he and his daughter. So that doesn't bode well for Jerry's amazing jacket. The purpose of this scene is we see Elaine with her father and we learn why it took so long for her to get there and the whole dilemma with Jerry's jacket at the end. My overall take on this scene, it's it's nice that we don't get another faceless person in Elaine's storyline. Finally, what this uh, Elaine storyline is about is revealed in that we we actually meet someone that Elaine's talking about. <laughs> and I think that was really done well. I think Lawrence Tierney as Alton Bennis was perfection. Just, I mean, you can just feel the intimidation. And then I like that in this scene, we find out more about Elaine. We find out that she's reading manuscripts at Pendant Publishing. We see a little bit of her relationship with her father. It's rounding out the character a bit more. And it's about time. You know, as I've discussed, Elaine hasn't gotten a solo storyline where we actually see it play out. So this was nice that we... We got to see it. Now, most of it does involve Jerry and George interacting with her dad. So it's not without some imbalance, but at least we do have some more information revealed about the Elaine character. All right, and then moving on to the last scene of the episode, Jerry's apartment the next day. The jacket is ruined. It's hanging in the bathroom in the background and Kramer sees it. Oh, man. He's just as heartbroken and Jerry barely wants to talk about it. Elaine arrives. They're going to the movies. She informs Jerry that her dad really liked him and had fun at the dinner. Thinks George is gay. Uh, Pretty much thinks everyone's gay. It's not just because of the singing. And I kind of like that, too, where Jerry, again, is just like, oh, okay, especially when when Elaine says, oh, yeah, he said you remind him of his friend from Korea. (laughs) And, oh, that's just a great moment. Kramer mentions the ruined jacket and then Elaine sees what's going on with it and is so heartbroken for Jerry. And she just says, oh, you know what you should have done? You should have worn it inside out. And here again, I love that Jerry protects Elaine's feelings. This is very indicative of the early episodes, Elaine and Jerry relationship, because later Jerry will almost enjoy ruining Elaine's mood, (laughs) loves offending her. So this is still in this period of time where Jerry and Elaine have this more amicable and caring, I guess, relationship. So he just kind of protects her, her feelings and says, Oh, yeah, it wasn't your dad who told me to not wear it inside out. Um, And it's basically your dad's fault. He doesn't doesn't go there. He just just kind of accepts. Oh, my gosh, that was a great idea, Elaine. Why didn't I think of that? The purpose of this scene is to resolve all the storylines. My overall take on the scene is it was fine. Nothing great, nothing bad. Just a need to resolve everything that happened. And we find out (laughs) Kramer is going to take the jacket. See, I like it like this. So Kramer, that's also the last we see of Alton Bennis. He never comes back and I'll go into that later. (laughs) But right now let's take a quick break and I'll see you on the other side. Shoot. Excuse me. 
Oh, are, are we recording? Oh. Hi, my name is Drexel Barton, amateur magician, collector of old aspirin bottles, and most importantly, expert bird sitter. That's right. You can trust me, Drexel Barton, with taking care of your birds any time you need to go out of town. I'll love them like you love them. Being an animal lover who is allergic to most fur and almost all kinds of pet dander, I was so relieved to learn that bird feathers have no effect on my allergies. So if you find yourself in need of a bird sitter, just text my mom, Dina Martin, at 555-2473. That's 555-BIRD. My availability is subject to when I get a slot at Magic Camp, but my mom can fill you in on all that. I come highly recommended. Here is a satisfied customer. Oh, oh, hi. Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Dina Martin. No, Bob. Don't, don't, don't. Oh, oh, no. I mean, hi, I'm Tina Martin, and Drexel is the sweetest and most responsible boy. You will have nothing to worry about if your bird is under Drexel's care. He plays his tambourine and sings to them. He is just the best bird sitter you could ever ask for. <sighs> thanks, Bob. I mean, thank you, Tita. So make sure you use me, Drexel Martin, as your bird sitter the next time you need a vacation. Polly Wada Cracker? Nope. Polly Wada Drexel. And we're back. Okay, I'm really excited. This is the first episode that I can introduce a new segment. A segment I've been waiting to do on this show. I'm calling it Jacket Tracker. Okay, so <laughs> this whole segment came about because of an episode of Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee. Jerry had Neil Brennan on as a guest. Now, he's the co-creator of Chappelle's show. He's a super funny guy, super brilliant guy. During the episode, he admitted to Jerry that he'd only seen maybe seven episodes of Seinfeld and that it really wasn't his thing, but that just in general, he doesn't like sitcoms. So he just was kind of admitting that to Jerry. And then he says, every time I turned on Seinfeld, you guys were worried about a jacket. Okay. Jerry laughs really hard at that in the episode. And I laughed super hard at that. Just first of all, it was just, it was just his delivery. Like he was so kind of annoyed that like, yeah, what was with this jacket stuff all the time? And then I kind of brushed it off. And then I thought, Oh my gosh, he's not, he's not wrong. For a guy who's not a huge fan of the show, he really kind of clued in and zeroed in on something that is, it is really prominent. I mean, there are, like, if I just do like a casual rundown of episodes from my memory, I can name seven or eight that have some kind of a jacket storyline. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm doing this podcast. I have to have a jacket tracker segment where I recognize whenever there is a jacket present in the, you know, ever present in the storyline. And what better episode to start that with than an episode called The Jacket? Oh, I'm excited. I don't know why. I'm so, it makes me giddy. I'm so excited to point out whenever there is a jacket discussed, worried about, or just, I don't know, make some kind of an appearance that's very prominent in the episode and, and it's discussed in the episode. So, all right, the first Jacket Tracker segment episode is The Jacket. And that's the segment, really. I just wanted to uh, give a little background and recognize that this is one of, this is the very first episode where we have to talk about a jacket. It's a very jacket forward episode. And it's called The Jacket. I need to stop saying jacket. Okay. Now, moving on to the extras, there was an inside look. Um, so some some interviews uh, behind the scenes. And again, this is no surprise. This exact scenario of what happens with not only The Jacket, but with Alton Bennis and meeting him, this was based on Larry David's past and an exact scenario. I mean, 
Everything from meeting her father in the lobby of a hotel. So uh, when Larry was dating Monica Yates, her father uh, is Richard Yates, who is the, the author of Revolutionary Road, just a brilliant writer. And yeah, it was the same scenario. She was late uh, to the hotel. <laughs> Larry was stuck with this very intimidating and very grumpy older brilliant writer and it just caused so much awkwardness he had a new suede jacket he had to put it inside I mean it was just kind of beat for beat this entire episode is just uh, plucked from Larry David's real life besides that the inside look was almost all about how insane Lawrence Tierney behaved on set he was Perfect for the role. Brilliant actor. Uh, Jason Alexander and Julia Louis-Dreyfus partook in the, the interviews and Tom Sharones, who was the director. And as JLD put it, Lawrence Tierney was a total nut job. Apparently, he stole a knife from Jerry's apartment set from the knife block. And they all could see that he did that. And Jerry just had no problem confronting him, just kind of very lightly said, hey, what do you, what do you got in your jacket? And it seemed to take Lawrence Tierney by surprise. And his way of cutting uh the tension was to take the knife out from his jacket and do the psycho kind of stabbing motion with the ring, ring, ring. Yeah, it was it was kind of terrifying, as the cast put it. And Larry would often threaten the director, Tom Sharones, with bringing Tierney back as a tactic to uh, sort of get his way with uh, decisions for the show. There was a deleted scene, and it was really just an extension of the first shopping scene with Elaine and Jerry. Elaine is actually a little more acerbic in the uh, in the top of the scene. She's kind of annoyed with Jerry. She's trying to just get him moving with this whole shopping adventure. She's annoyed. She's carrying his wallet. I mean, it's just it just it doesn't really go with the rest of the tone of the scene. I mean, again, she laughs so hard at his Thai car wash thing. So I don't know. Up top in this deleted scene, it was like, oh, she's super annoyed with him. So and then at the end of the scene, so they kind of just cut it out. They cut out the top of the scene and at the end of the scene. So what we see in the episode is really this middle chunk of what they had filmed. The scene originally was supposed to end with Elaine really pushing Jerry to get this jacket. She's like, come on, just get it. You get it. You just need to get it. And she kind of says, oh, I just love to watch other people spend money. Eh, it was all extra fat that definitely needed to be cut off. So we didn't really lose much not getting that in the original episode. All right, now to move on to Contributor Corner, we have a new contributor today, uh, Beth. And uh, Beth and I, we met on the improv scene in Detroit. She is so fun and so full of energy when you see her, just the nicest, nicest woman. So Beth from Lake Orion, Michigan, her Seinfeld story, she started watching from the beginning and was, oh, she just really is so glad that... It was given a chance to grow and get funnier and funnier. And Beth says, I loved the ensemble cast and that she also just loved that the Elaine character was just wasn't a token, right? She wasn't the boring straight man. She wasn't the woman reacting to the antics of the men. And she loves Seinfeld because it still makes her laugh to this day just as hard as when she originally viewed them. And the three things she loves about Elaine Bennis, her comic wit, her hair, and though she's tiny, she's strong. I mean, look at those mighty shoves she gives. Get out! Yes, Beth, I agree 100% with everything you just said. So with this episode, I'm just going to mention some of the things that uh, Beth emailed in to me on her rewatch of The Jacket. She really thought this was a pretty good Elaine-centric episode, starting with Elaine accompanying Jerry on a shopping spree where he buys an expensive jacket. Beth says, an observation I noticed was Elaine needing Jerry and George with her to meet with her father, the author Alton Bennis. She seemed clearly distressed when Jerry seemed to waffle about going, and she asked him to, please come, I need a buffer, and it's been a while since I've seen him. And Beth goes on to say how, yeah, we definitely can see why, considering George calls him a lunatic a little bit later. Um, Back to the shopping scene, Beth says, Jerry shares his nervousness about accompanying Elaine to see her father by saying he's intimidated by him because he's such a great writer and that, frankly, he prefers the company of nitwits. Beth says, this is where Elaine gets a great line of, so that's why we're not together anymore. Uh Oh, Beth pointed out a bit of trivia that Ryan Stiles from Whose Line 
Ryan is it anyway, auditioned for the role of that salesman in that store. So it would have been kind of interesting to see Ryan Stiles uh, deliver those lines. <laughs> Beth thought it was an interesting choice having George constantly singing Master of the House from Les Mis. She says, was that perhaps a subtle foreshadowing of Alton Bennis and that he might be the master of the Bennis house? Hmm, I kind of like that. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a little bit more background on Lawrence Tierney and Beth sent this in. She said that he's mostly known for bad guy roles in older films such as Hoodlum and Dillinger. According to some bio I read on him, Lawrence Tierney had a long-standing reputation of being difficult, prone to fights, alcoholism, and several bouts in jail. Even Quentin Tarantino, who casted and directed him in Reservoir Dogs, complained of his difficulty and lamented hiring him. How unfortunate this man couldn't get his demons under control, not just for his own good, but even career-wise. A recurring gig on Seinfeld would be a great gig for any actor, but especially an older actor who, let's be honest, television and movies often overlook the older demographic, even more so a few decades ago. Beth says it's too bad. Sounds like he was his own worst enemy. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. I mean, they went into his behavior on set and that inside look that I mentioned. It was just so off-putting. They just really vowed never to bring him back. So that kind of lends itself to the fact that Elaine never really has any family storyline. Every other character does. I don't know why they couldn't have just recast someone like they did with both Jerry and George's fathers. <laughs> but I don't know. It would have been nice to have maybe a little bit more interaction with Elaine and her father in uh, later episodes. Beth goes on to say that she loves when Julie Louis-Dreyfus retells the whole Doves thing. And she says she does such an amazing retelling of it that we kind of feel like we were there and we could see it unfold. Then Beth has some comments about Elaine's interaction with her father and how tense it is. Beth says her answers are at first limited to one word answers. No one in response to the question, who's the lipstick for? Fine in response to how's your mother? Then he asks if she's working and she defeatedly has to remind him again that yes, she's working for Pendant Publishing when he then promptly degrades it by calling them bastards. (laughs) And Beth says it's hard to tell if Alton Bennis, the author, had a bad run in with Pendant Publishing or is he just being passively aggressive and dismissive to his daughter's place of employment? Elaine then has a cute moment, almost childlike, when she exclaims, it's snowing. Oh, Beth, I love that, too. I don't know why. It was adorable. And finally, Beth says, despite her father's gruffness and the tension between them, she seemed to resort back to a cute, childlike way. And then Beth's final thought, if Alton Bennis had indeed become a recurring character, I would have preferred they soften him up a bit, at least to Elaine. I think he made her tense and it wasn't a happy relationship. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Beth. I think... Once again, I said it a little bit before, but it's kind of a disservice to the Elaine character to not bring him back. Like I said, if (laughs) this Lawrence Tierney guy was just too crazy for everyone, I'm pretty sure they could have found someone else and replaced them. They did it twice before. Maybe that was why. Maybe they said, oh, God, we've done this twice before. We can't do it again. Although, no, I'm sorry. They just done it once at that point. They hadn't replaced um, George's father yet. Ooh, I'm getting ahead of myself. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, again, maybe this is a little bit more of the we don't know how to write for Elaine kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I really do think they could have had some really fun interactions with Alton and Elaine in later episodes. Okay, and our other contributor this week is Greg, and we've heard from him a couple of times, always has some great comments. So for this episode, Greg says, the amount of discussion about this purchase by all four characters equates to probably 18 to 22 minutes of dialogue. He's talking about the jacket here. The scenes in Jerry's apartment after the purchase, but before the dinner, are paced very slowly, and all of it is about the jacket, with the exception of George's earworm tune issue, which to me is more relatable than it is funny. As for the jacket, episode accurately titled, (laughs) it's not like he bought a house. It is literally an article of clothing, and yet everyone is so fascinated by the cost. Yeah, they really mined as much as they could from this jacket storyline. It was just squeezed to death. I agree, Greg. I'm not sure it really warranted that much, especially... uh, I'll say it again, because the jacket's not that great. My suede bias coming in again. (laughs) Uh, Greg goes on to say, Elaine in the opening is adorable with her whole interaction with Jerry. I love when she goofily laughs at one of his dumb jokes, in this case, the Thai car wash bit. She also shows her wit, sidestepping his setup of preferring to be around nitwits. Yes, agreed, agreed, Greg. 
thought it was really well done in the in the beginning. I like their interaction a lot. Greg's third point, Elaine's family is the least explored of the four, and I don't quite understand why that is. I think the setup of this stern Mr. Bennis was truly not funny enough to pursue. He's no Frank Costanza, that's for sure. Considering this is her relative, her interaction with him is minimal. Wow, I didn't think of it that way, Greg. I, I like that. Yeah, I mean, he was sort of tough to watch, but the comedy was more in how he made other people uncomfortable. So I do think, though, and it would have to be very, you know, controlled doses of bringing him back if they were to have brought him back. It certainly couldn't have been on par with a Frank Costanza played by Jerry Stiller. It would have to be very kind of, oh, here and there. And maybe that would just run out really quickly after a while, too. Okay, here's Alton Bennis again. Jerry and George are going to try not to shit their pants every time he's around. I don't know. So perhaps it was just, yeah, like like Greg said, perhaps it just wasn't funny enough to pursue. I kind of like that. Greg goes on to say, Elaine's recanting of her evening prior to dinner, waiting in Kramer's car and getting towed, is her at her best. Over-exaggerated with a lot of physical movement, climaxing with a thump down into a chair. Agreed. And Greg ends his thoughts uh, just appreciating that there was a lot more Elaine in this episode and that the writers probably realized as episodes went on that they'd much rather see what Elaine and George are up to without Jerry you know that they're in the earlier episodes everyone kind of has to be together everything sort of has to affect Jerry but as we see as the show evolves all the other characters kind of get their own storylines but we do get the dovetailing at the end. Okay, uh, my favorite Elaine moments, that monologue at the hotel explaining why she was late. That was her best material she was given and she did she did a great job with it. My, my final notes, I mean, this is the first substantial Elaine episode in a while. We find out more about Elaine, where she's working, this relationship with her father. Granted, a lot of the father's storyline is usurped by <laughs> Jerry and George and their reaction to him, but it still had some good Elaine moments. Most of the magic, I think, was with Tierney's performance, Lawrence Tierney's performance, and Jason Alexander and Jerry Seinfeld's reactions to him. So that that was really the rich parts of the episode with a sprinkling of good Elaine moments here and there. And that's all I can say about the jacket. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next time. 